Well, good afternoon and welcome back to you all to Bite Size Corrosion. As we continue our discussion on the NACE SP502 discussing ECDA. And finally, we're making progress through the discussion and we are now at stage three where we're going to be talking about direct assessment of our pipe. It's wonderful to have Frances Bradfield back with us again today in the third session that she's with us talking about stage three direct assessment. And as we kick off, it's a good reminder that we've gone through stages one and two where we pre-assessed our pipe, we try to find all the available historical data. We categorized our pipeline into various zones. And just a reminder that these zones are not necessarily geographically co-located. They can be quite distant from each other, but in terms of what information we have about our pipe, we can classify our pipeline as being in similar locations. Yesterday's session, we discussed how we were going to get additional data about our pipe by using various survey techniques. And so having analyzed our pipeline, we're now at the point where we can jump into the hole, as it were, and do a direct assessment. So this is just what it might look like. And we mustn't forget that the direct assessment stage is really the most expensive stage. And so it's important that we make sure that we're choosing the right place. I don't know if you have any comments in that regard. Basically, I think we drove the point home yesterday quite hard. It's not something you do really nilly. You really do need to make 100% sure you're digging where you need to. And obviously that you're digging in the right place, not two meters to the side. As you can see from the photo, if you were two meters to the left of the photo, you would have to dig up significant amounts of soil just to get to the defect. So we really try to make use of all the GPS locations and all of the fancy information that we have and pigging data from other lines and all sorts of things to make sure we have the position as accurately as we possibly can. Exactly. Now, NACE has done a flow chart for this section as they have for the other sections, which we have copied up here. Um, let's have a quick look at the flow chart and, and look at what we can expect in this stage. So I think the very first thing, and it's again something we brought up last time, was we need to prioritize the need for direct examination. So the ECDA process sounds like something you start on a Monday and then you're digging up on the Friday. But of course, that's not the case. We have all of the pre-assessment information to get, and then we do our indirect assessment for the locations that we're missing additional data for. And from there, we need to prioritize where we want to dig up. And these digs can go on over months, one dig this month, one dig next month. We want to choose the worst, the absolute worst case or what we expect to be the worst case. And we want to investigate that first so that if there is a massive problem and we are actively corroding our pipeline, we can do some remediation immediately. Um, one of the questions that I think is worth asking and answering is, do we need to dig in every zone or are there places where there's no digging required? I think we don't want to dig in this one type of zone in each type of zone, for example. So we need to, if we have five different zones called A, we only need to dig one of them and we would prioritize which of those based on the worst case within that classification of zone A, which could be in the middle of a field, for example. So no, we don't need to dig everywhere, but we do need to dig in each type of zone. And I think that's a good take home. Thank you for that. Now, once we do dig, obviously we want to see what we can find. And I managed to pull out, this is just a reminder from yesterday. We did see that we identified that as a, an indication of a defect. And then let's talk about what we found there and why it's what we expected or not what we expected. Right. So in the SIPs data, we saw that it was a protected defect because both the off and on potentials were protected or more negative than the protective criterion of 950, I think, is there mm. millivolts. And so we expect that even though there's a defect, we are getting active cathodic protection at that location. Now, this was a really nice one, and I think that is my hand. <laughs> it's one of the ones that I actually did. We had the defect. You can see the hole in the coating at the top, but we can see that the white calcareous deposit, which is exactly what we expect to build up with effective cathodic protection, is clearly visible. 
And that's really good. It means that, yes, we had a defect in the pipe, but it's been protected. We've got a nice chemical protective layer on the top and nice and high pH. We don't expect any corrosion to be happening there. And that's a really good pat on the back for the corrosion engineers, making sure that the CP system is working well. It's not always like that. Sometimes we find a defect, like we chatted about yesterday, where it's protected neither in the CP system on nor the CP system off scenario. And then you end up with not such a pretty story. No, this is, you can see that the coating on that picture was completely falling off. So we knew it was a really large defect because of the large current drain and the length between the on and off kind of switch that we had. And again, please go back into the Teachable platform and have a look at the SIPS lecture because I think it'll help tie this in quite nicely. But here you can see this is a massive defect. It's an old bitumen coating that's completely falling off the pipe. So yay, we found it. But <laughs> it's not all roses and sunshine. You can see here that we have absolutely no white deposit. So we have no calcareous layer. And you can actually see the iron oxide red rust forming here. So all in all, this isn't a pretty picture. We're not very happy with this at all. We're not happy with the findings, but we are happy that the findings corroborate what we expected. Yeah, precisely. Da all data is good data, even if it paints a sad picture. I just think that it's worth having a little digress onto safety in this yeah. day and age. Fran, I know you've got some quite strong feelings in this regard. I, I do. I'm currently in Denmark, which has the whopping population of 5 million people. But every year, three people are killed in trench collapses. And this has got the most stringent safety requirements I've ever seen and ever worked on in any construction that I've done before. And it's just, it goes to show it looks harmless. There's a whole lot of soil, but really you're getting into a death trap every single time. So you need to make sure that you've got all the proper trench slopes and if they need shoring that they're shored up properly it's not something to take lightly and when you get yourself into a hole make sure you can get out that goes for many things but probably <laughs> pipeline trenches is, is a good one to remember i think there's a tendency to either think oh well i'm only going to be a minute and i think that is one of the concerns about safety is that we think it won't happen to us because i'm not going to take long and of course, an unsafe situation can occur faster than that. And I think also we think that, well, maybe we'll be able to cope. You know, yes, there's water in the trench, for example, and that can be pretty dicey. In general, don't go into something where you can't see the bottom. That's not a good idea. But you can see they've shored it up. But it is something I would definitely not get into even if there was no water in there. You can see that the shoring is old and it looks like it might break apart at any minute. So it's just something else. Not only does an unsafe situation make it more difficult to do your job, but it is unsafe and you could do serious damage to yourself or die. So, I mean, without harping on too much, if you're going to get in a trench, just make sure you're safe. Yeah, very, very good idea. Once we've been and done our trenching, I think it's important that we look at what are we doing in the trench? We've now got a pipe. What are we going to do with what we find there? How important is this stage? So I think this is the most important stage because before the direct assessment, we are guessing based on good knowledge and good engineering principles and all the things that we expect. But at the end of the day, expectations can be wrong. So it's really important you know, for example, in the first defect where we actually found the calcareous deposit, imagine we saw rust in that location, then we'd have to rethink our entire results of all that SIPS DCVG data mm -hmm. that we had, because where we expected it to be protected, it wasn't. So we may have had to include additional digs, for example, just to verify that. So it is the most important thing. And I think it's important to understand that you need people who exactly know what they're looking for. Anybody can get in a trench and say, oh, look, there's a hole in the coating. But was the hole in the coating made now when they just did the excavation? You can easily damage coating as you do it, in which case that doesn't really play into the ECDA concept. Or is it old? Is the coating falling off the pipe? Is it not? Is this what degradation you would expect from the coating over this time period, one year, 10 years, 50 years, or not? So, you know, you, you need to have somebody who's really well versed in those principles, in coating and in corrosion. And that might not be you. 
specifically the owner operator of the pipeline. Maybe you can come in and do the mechanical section. Maybe you need somebody to come in and help with the CP section. But I think just having horses for courses, the right guy in the trench, because you don't know what you might miss if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. I think it's also really important that you document what you're doing with a lot of photographs. And the worst thing about photographs is that they end up with the phone enabled numbering system completely intelligible. So take the time afterwards to actually label what they are and the sequence of them so that you can go back and reference them in the future. Yeah, um, nowadays you can get all sorts of very good art gifts like GIS system software where you can go and take a photograph and it geotags the location and you can fill in all the information you need when you're there. It, I think it's quite expensive, but it definitely could be something worth investigating if you have a large project coming up because that makes it so much easier. You have a map and you can just see this is where this defect was. This is what it looked like before. This is what it looked like afterwards. And I think it's important that, that you don't just look at the defect, but you look at what's around the defect. So what was the condition of the soil? Were there contaminants? What's the condition of the coating before you even get to the pipe? Is it still in good condition falling off? Yeah. All of those don't underestimate putting on your Sherlock Holmes hat no. and the value that has. And actually, I think that it can be of a lot of value for you to be present at the last stages of excavation where they're doing hand digging so that you can see, as you say, the condition of the soil. Obviously, you don't want to be there when they're there with the back actors and setting up the trench. But once they get down to it, of course, you can't use a back actor when you're very close to a pipe. You really want to be there so that you can get the whole thing. Like, did the coating just fall off? Did somebody whack it with a spade? you know, just so that you've got that history of what happened when you opened up the pipe to start with. So we've got some photographs of a scenario, which I found quite interesting. This was a defect identified through the DCVG process. And once excavated, you can see, yes, there's definitely a hole. And as you go through and start cleaning it up and then removing the coating, you can see to get to a firm surface, that small little defect has actually become quite a large defect of concern. Before you close that up again, you need to have adherent coating. That could mean widening your excavation if you have a lot of despondment of your coating along the line. Here, it's a little defect. I think it was what, two centimeters diameter, mm. but you can see that there's a slightly lighter ring around it. And that shows that we actually had under creep from the defect itself. So we had the defect with a rock or a stone or a back actor when they put in the pipe, scratch the coating, and then the corrosion has gone underneath and we've picked it up at this stage. But if you left it for 15 years, you could have several centimeters of despondent coating. And the worst part about that is you can't get your CP to your pipeline underneath despondent coating. So you have a very nice little ecosystem for corrosion there. <laughs> That's not ideal. <laughs> Yeah. And obviously repairing these is of critical importance, making sure that um, this has been prepared for repair and patching is not a good idea. No, yeah. no, I think it generally it isn't. However, I will say literally this year, I've been introduced to some products where they basically put a polyurethane splice kit that they've made. It makes it like a barnacle that you can put over these kinds of defects but it does rely on good adherent coating with not so porous surface around it. So you can do that now and, and there's some very good things. I think these specific ones I'm talking about are from Ketna, so you guys can go ahead and have a look if you're interested. But generally, you wouldn't want to patch this. You would do preparation and then a full circumferential wrap to about half a meter and half a meter on either side of the defect. And one of the challenges, of course, is if you've got a polyethylene coating, you need to make sure that whatever you choose, well, we know nothing sticks to polyethylene. So you do need to make certain that you've got a good system so that you don't cause this problem either to extend or just to continue. Again, in this kind of case, you can see it's nice shiny metal. We didn't have any active corrosion, but if you were to leave this, and something were to happen to the CP system, of course, we would expect corrosion to happen here. So we do need to repair it. And as I just said, if you have the gap between your coating and the steel, you can have a microsphere of corrosion under there. So 
you really need to make sure that your wrapping joint is completely sealed. Coating suppliers and coating teams should know how to do this. <laughs> it's worth doing your research for the good ones. That, and it's, it's worth making sure that you've got an inspector in the trench, making sure that it's done properly. Correct. Because buried mistakes always come back to haunt us. Just returning back to this flowchart, because I think it's so important. Now that we've seen our defect, and obviously subsequently we've repaired it, but we've recorded all the damage, we now need to make sure that our hypothesis is being proven. Did I find what I would expect to find? Exactly. And if we didn't find what we expected to find, or if we didn't find anything, so let's say we dug where we saw a big defect, but we couldn't find the defect, we might need to go back and reevaluate. And as I said, even add an additional dig to your program. I think something that we maybe just missed before you wrap the pipe had any defects, even if it doesn't look like there has been corrosion, checking the wall thickness of the pipe is pretty critical. As you can see here, number 5.6, remaining strength evaluation. That's mm -hmm. how we can be sure that we still have mechanical stability for the remainder of the lifetime of the pipe. If we find that we've got significant wall thickness loss, we might actually need to cut out a section of the pipe and reweld it. Or, you know, if it's really bad and it's everywhere, decommissions part of it and put in a bypass, for example. I think ECDA sometimes used kind of put the plaster on, but mark it that it needs to be, there needs to be a, a decent intervention and replacement. And maybe that needs to be programmed into a convenient shut period or. That's the next step. When we get to the post assessment, we will talk about looking at all of our data and predicting the lifetime of the pipe, saying, can we extend the lifetime? Can we keep it the same? And then scheduling our next ECDA. So scheduling all the interim maintenance, for example, and then another ECDA at the end of it. I think one of the important things that we often miss in this ECDA process is that we focus on this root cause analysis. What caused what we found? And by virtue of that, once we've identified what the cause is, can we put measures in place to mitigate that as a risk? Exactly. So I think when you have a defect in your coating, that's why I say be there when they're busy doing the final dig. It should be pretty evident. Was it an old coating defect from when they installed the pipe? Or was it new from when they were just digging the pipe? Or have they previously done excavations for other services, utilities, fiber, anything like that recently? And could it have been from that? So the root cause for the damage, yes. And then the root cause at the damage site would be, is it protected, yes or no? Were we expecting protection, yes or no? So if we were expecting protection and we didn't find it, what could be giving us this false reading? Did we have a very high resistant soil, for example, or were we walking over a pavement, something that could give us a false potential reading as we went over? Would there be maybe a source of current drain right next to the pipeline there, something that could be stealing the CP? Perhaps there was a shielding effect from a large water pipe or plastic pipe, something like that, in the vicinity. And all of these things, you need to check it all out and come up with a story, basically, a backstory for your defect. Create its history. But, but that can be so useful. I think one of the other challenges is, is that some of the smaller pipes, perhaps the fuel lines, are often in multi-pipe corridors. And these excavations can be quite challenging because sometimes if your pipes are close enough to each other, you're not sure which pipeline you're going to find the damage on. And I'm sure that can be a little bit stressful. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit stressful. It's not easy. And sometimes these excavations are so, I mean, they're as big as they can be, but you can't even get between the pipes to look at the pipe you're trying to look at. So that can be a challenge. In some cases, those pipes are touching each other whether they were installed like that or whether they moved like that over the course of a few decades, nobody really knows. But if you have two pipes touching each other, slightly moving as they go, as they heat up, as they cool down, we end up with a very nice big coupled pipeline with a large section. So And, and fretting damage, yeah. I think the one exciting thing about direct inspection is that it makes it very real 
And I think it's helpful for people who have been perhaps a little skeptical about corrosion and cathodic protection, for example, to actually see in practice that corrosion is real, causes damage, wall thinning and so on. But cathodic protection is also real. And yes, we found the defect, but no, there was no corrosion. And yes, we found the white residue, so therefore we know that the CP worked. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we, we shouldn't lose sight of, that there's merit for the process outside of just solving our pipe problems. And often showing people with shiny shoes, I call them, the managers who sit behind their desks and have the big checkbooks and the shiny shoes, showing them down and dirty pictures of corroding pipelines really makes brands and scents seem real. You know, they can see if this bursts, this is the impact. Whereas we say, oh, your pipe is at risk of actively corroding. And they go, yeah, no, it's fine. It's been there for 50 years. It'll be there for another 50 years. Having something tangible, photographs, bringing the guy with the shiny shoes, giving him some PPE and putting him in the trench to show him something terrible can really be a way uh, to help you get your point across a bit. Right, thank you, Fran. I think that's been a useful discussion on, on direct assessment of pipeline defects and of the ECDA process in action. And I think that it's highlighted the importance of getting our good documentation, making sure that all our findings are captured correctly so that we can find them again. And also, of course, what we do in this ECDA, and we'll discuss it more next time, is going to become part of the pre-assessment in the next ECDA. And if we've been actively involved and the pre-assessment was challenging this time around, I'm hopeful that one saves the documentation in such a way that next time it causes fewer stress lines and gray hairs. Yeah, of course, I think, I think we want to take all of our data, have a nice report and sort of keep making new revisions of it, updating the same document again and again, obviously archiving stuff that's no longer relevant. And that way you're saving the next generation of people from having to go find you in a bar and buy you a drink and ask you if you remembered what happened when you dug up that pipeline in 2001. Exactly that. <laughs> right. Thank you, Francis. I think that's been really helpful. And I think that it'll be good to tie this all together when we meet again next time, um, we'll be finalizing the formal process with the post-assessment stage. And then on Wednesday next week, we're going to be looking at ECDA in practice and just some of the real life experiences and findings and where that has taken various pipeline asset owners.